So in Psalm 50, again, the top it says a psalm of Asaph. And in the Hebrew it's Tephilim. These are songs, S-O-N-G. These are simply songs in a song book from the original hymn book, if you will, of the temple. And there's neat little things as we go through. You can, uh, there's the Hallels. It's a group of psalms that are praises. Um, there's what's called the Ascents, A-S-C-E-N-T-S. And that's a group of psalms that they would say one or sing one and then take a step up and sing the next one, take a step up and sing the next one. As you might imagine, those are some of the shorter psalms. I get, you wouldn't want to sing Psalm 119 and then, <laughs> and then go for the next step. But, uh, Psalm 119 being not only the longest chapter in Psalms, but the longest uh, chapter actually in the Bible. So Psalm 50, a psalm of Asaph. And what we're going to do is read through this psalm and then come back and start again and look at some key points. Our goal when you come in here, whenever you come in here, and especially on Thursdays and Sunday nights, is to share as a teacher what we call the milk, meat, and the gospel. And what we mean by that is when we say uh, milk, we mean giving spiritual milk to people who are young or immature in their faith. And so there's a uh, you know, portion in the teaching for them. Meat in the sense of mature Christians uh, or want something a little meatier to chew on, if you will. And so there's the, the deeper applications and whatnot. And then you always want to have the gospel as part of it. And I know, knowing many of you, you know, by face and name, I know many of you, if not all of you, are saved this evening. And yet, there's people listening that don't know. And we need to be sure to share the gospel. And we can always listen and learn more about the gospel at that point. So, milk, meat, and the gospel. Now, what does that mean technically for you? Well, one thing it means is that you don't have to necessarily understand everything in a teaching to benefit from it. Some things you'll understand tonight. Some things you may have to dig a little bit. Some things you may have to dig a lot. See what the Lord has for you. Be willing to reach for it and be willing to dig for it. So let's read this psalm. Let's read this Psalm 50. A psalm of Asaph. And if there's a question about uh, the numbering, this psalm starts with the mighty one, God the Lord. The mighty one. God the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. Sounds familiar. Recently we were talking about he is there and he is not silent. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice and let the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge hear all my people and I will speak O Israel and I will testify against you 
I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house nor goats out of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. So have you ever heard that saying, you know, people, Christians, believe say, my daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's where they get it from. And you can say that too, if you're a believer, right? My daddy owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, verse 11, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. Mm. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what? right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth seeing you hate instruction and cast my words behind you when you saw a thief you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers you give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit you sit and speak against your brother you slander your own mother's son these things you have done and I've kept silent you thought that I was altogether like you but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Mm. What an awesome psalm. I mean, there's some great stuff in there. But we're also reminded that that seeker-friendly model is more of man's model than God's. I mean, I can't imagine somebody in a seeker-sensitive service sitting there and, hell, going to tear you in pieces. You know, I mean, that's real. That's what it says. Of course, you wouldn't be hearing verse by verse probably in a seeker sense of church. But here we go verse by verse so we don't skip anything, don't leave anything out. We see these things which are... And these words are not meant to separate us from God, but to realize there is an existing separation already there. And maybe you think, well, I don't know, no, no, I'm born again, so well, praise God. That means, you, you know, you get a fresh start every morning, amen? And that means you can reach and follow God knowing that he has, you know, put in place something to catch us if we fall. The Bible is the first and foremost net to catch us. And it will catch us actually before we fall, if we listen to it. Mm. Now let's look back over it, starting at the beginning again. And, you know, it's interesting. It, it talks about, in this psalm, you know, being called and making sacrifices and offerings. and It is, it is so awesome because I'm going through 
uh, the Bible in several different places and getting to dig in some stuff and really, really kind of freshly enjoying uh, digging into the Word. And let me encourage you to spend time in the Word. And, you know, maybe your answer would be, man, I already spent, you know, 15 minutes or half hour, an hour or Spend more time in the Word. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much time you're spending in the Word, spend more time. Because it, it's, it's so awesome. It's so cleansing. It's so encouraging. Mm. I just got an image. I'm so depressed. Wish you would minister to me. Wish you cared about how my how I felt and all my feelings. I'm busy texting. I can't read the word right now. It's a bunch of do's and don'ts. Just makes me feel bad. I wonder how many times that exact scene is repeated. We're on the phone digging, looking for encouragement. And there encouragement sits. By the way, that's not one of those for y'all messages. This is for all of us. Because a Bible teacher can, it probably even more so, not be careful to take personal time to dig into a word. It's interesting what I was reminded of. You know, do you know who gave us the main tools in the recent fight against the virus, against COVID? I'm not talking about the vaccine or anything. But who gave us the main tools to, to deal with that? God did. Absolutely did. Here's the first life lesson. Over 3,500 years ago, in the book of Leviticus... God said, when somebody is sick, they should wash themselves daily for a week and for seven days stay outside the camp. That's where we got our hand washing and quarantine from. Isn't that fascinating? 3,500 years ago. Let me say it again. Over 3,500 years ago, in the book of Leviticus, God said, when somebody is sick, they should wash themselves daily for a week and for seven days stay outside the camp. That's where we got our hand washing and quarantine from. So, I had a little additional note on some. Thank you, God, once again, for being more trustworthy than modern science. I believe in true science with hypotheses that are often wrong. So others may believe the science. I choose to believe in God. Thank you, God, for these tools. Amen. Yeah, praise God, man. If you want to see that one again, it's on the, my personal Facebook. I don't think I've copied it over to the, the bridge and the, across the bridge. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I say trust the science. I'm not going to get it. But when we dig into the Word, Remember, we're, we're doing just that. We're digging into the Word. So that's actually our next life lesson. When we have Bible study, we dig in. We study. We learn things. So we, we kind of flick the, the switch on our brains on. Now, if you're watching from somewhere away from here, be aware of the dynamics of watching on your phone or at computer screen or a television screen is that you can have three or four different things going on at once. Now don't you know if the enemy can distract you, he will, especially in that given environment, at just the right time when there's a word of encouragement coming for you and then you get distracted for a moment and now, God, will, he's faithful. He'll say it again and again until you get it. But it'd be nice to catch it the first time. So be careful about sharing, you know, your attention when you're in here listening to a teaching or watching uh, online. 
and uh, there's a time you know to um, be reminded of things we know but there's also a time to to find out new things and to you know see a pattern revealed or prophecy revealed those things are awesome mm. Mm-mm-mm. So as we look at this, now again, I, you know, it's a, I realize that sometimes when I say Hebrew, immediately you think, well, I don't speak Hebrew. Well, that's, if you spoke Hebrew, I would probably just speak Hebrew. Too. But, you know, I'm teaching these things because they're very important. And honestly, you already speak some Hebrew. Did you know that? Amen. It's Hebrew. It's actually a beautiful picture meaning involving the mother. Hallelujah. That's a nice Hebrew word there. Hallel, praise. Yah is God. As a matter of fact, um, it talks in this first verse, the mighty one, God the Lord. Let me, let me show you something that's just absolutely a pleasure to do. Keep your finger right there on Psalm 50 and go to where the names of the books of the Bible are listed in your Bible. should be up front if you're in the English Bible, up front to the left. If you're in the Hebrew Bible, it'll be to the right. And why do English Bibles start to the left? Because they were... They were new. Hebrew is the is actually the right way because it came before, if you will. It came before English, so English is actually the backward one, if you think about it. But when you look at these names of the Bible, and I would encourage you to memorize them. It wouldn't it, it'd take you a couple of days, if, if, and that's just doing it a little bit each day, and then you will know where those books are. But what's very interesting, and if you uh, do you know, memorize the names, you can be thinking of this. Now, we already know about Joshua, but it's so fascinating. That's the name of Jesus. It means God is salvation. But then go down, you got Ruth, you know, Judges, Ruth. And then that's an interesting way to remember those three, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, like he had something, you know, against Ruth. So Joshua, Judges, or you remember it that way. And then the next double books the three of them are in alphabetical order going backwards in other words uh, S K C Samuel Kings and Chronicles first second Samuel first second Kings first second Chronicles Samuel L is the name of God you look at Kings you look at Chronicles then you've got S Ya look for A H which is usually a, uh, a version of Y-A-H, which is another name for God. You got Ez, Yah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, and then you come back with a whole host of those E-Ls. Ezekiel, Daniel, dan <clears throat> Dan means judge. El means God. So Daniel means God is judge. You got Hosea, Joel, again, name of God, E-L. So you see, and then you got Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, um, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. No, that's Malachi. That's <laughs> Malachi. But it's interesting to see how many times the name of God is in those names, isn't it? Huh. You'd almost think names are important to God. Huh. Yeah, you are. <laughs> well. So here's the thing. And here's the next one. Lesson. What, don't turn your brain off when you hear the word Hebrew. Instead, engage and learn. Because everyone can understand the Hebrew picture of the cross. 
I mean, that's a Hebrew picture right there in the corner. It's a Hebrew letter. It's a Hebrew symbol. It's a Hebrew picture. Now, we very much think of that as a New Testament, but if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard that this was an ancient Hebrew letter. Incidentally, it was the 22nd Hebrew letter, the last one. But because of that, the 22nd, the number 22 is messianic. Was that important? <laughs> well, isn't it a coinky dink that Genesis 22 is messianic? Psalm 22 is messianic? Revelation 22 is very messianic. And it goes from 1 to 22. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, yeah, but those chapter and verse visions, they came later. Yeah, did God know where they were going to be? Yeah, he did. So some of that is God using these numbers, symbols, and pictures to speak to us. Also, 23, 22 is the, the Tav, the, the ending, the messianic thing. 23 is what? A new beginning. What do we see in Genesis 23? A new beginning. What do we see in Psalm 23? Well, we look at it as an ending, but it's actually a new beginning. Talking about the shadow of death. And the pattern, you know, holds true. It's interesting. And another thing we want to kind of remind you of, because we're very much a teaching church. Jesus was a, had very much a teaching ministry. And we used to talk about this a bit. And, and incidentally, let me um, encourage you. I'm going to go from preaching to meddling. There's warning. <laughs> um, let me encourage you to get enough good healthy sleep and to eat somewhat healthy and there's ways you can do that you can take supplements and stuff and then I would don't try to eat 100% healthy because honestly I, I don't think that ever works you know because, or you're, you're, then you're telling grandma you can't eat any of her cake that she made for two days because you're, you're off of sweet <laughs> you know it, it's better just to you know have it you know, eating really well 90% of the time, having grace 10% of the time. And you're like, Pastor, you're a pastor. You're supposed to be talking to us about the Bible. I am. This book is filled with stuff about what to eat, how to eat it, and sleeping patterns, and how to treat each other, and all those things. So let me encourage you in those things. And if you need help, we're here. And you know, talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. Mm. And something that's important is to realize, you know, we're learning about God in the Bible. We're learning. We're continuing to learn. Sometimes we think, well, we no, we, we, we really, we're supposed to learn from like 1 to 18, and then we kind of quit learning, right? We get to stop. <laughs> no, no. Because if you quit learning at 18, you're going to be in a bunch of trouble. <laughs> We're to keep learning. And the Bible's the same way. We're to keep learning. Keep learning. So that's the next life lesson. We're to keep learning our entire lives. Michelangelo, who spoke Hebrew, <laughs> at 87 years old, after designing, sculpting, and painting many beautiful things, he said, Incaro Imparo, which is... I am always learning. Let me say that again. We are to keep learning our entire lives. Michelangelo, who spoke Hebrew, at 87 years old, after designing, sculpting, and painting many beautiful things, he said, Encaro Imparo, which is the Latin for I am always learning. Is that Italian? Uh, anyway. Okay, so um, the thing is to keep learning. That keeps our brains active. And the more active our brains are, the, more, the longer they stay active. 
I know society says, well, you know, there's a, always a marked decline as we get older. That's not really what the Bible says, is it? You had Joshua and Caleb out there trying to pick a fight at like 120 years old, man. That's great. They kept thinking. They kept moving. Mm. Now, we're going to jump into something here on the first verse and, and look at the verse 1 of Psalm 50. Um, it says, the mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. When you, if you're looking in the New King James or the King James or many versions similar, in that first line you've got the mighty one which is one, a name for God. And then you've got God, G-O-D, spelled regularly. And then you've got Lord, and you have L, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And what you'll notice is that sometimes when you see the word Lord, it's spelled normally with O-R-D in small letters, but sometimes it's all in capitals. That's actually a signal to you to know what word uh, is being translated. So, pardon me. Media, we're going to um, the middle of two-thirds down on page three. <laughs> That's me sticking to my notes again. <laughs> now, let's talk about something. And let's be honest with one another. It's interesting, we talked about seeker-sensitive, and the first seeker-sensitive church, of course, was with Aaron as assisting pastor, and Moses goes up on the hill. And the first act of Aaron, the assisting pastor, is to build a golden calf and declare a different feast than one of the seven. And... Mm, just did not, did not go well, right? And yet, if we're honest and look at the church these days, you can perhaps see bits and, and pieces of it. One, one of the reasons, let me go back to the eating and sleeping comment, which may have been, you thought that was kind of weird. Yeah, it was, but it was a, for, for in part a reason. And we have a friend of the ministry with CSN, a pastor I've known for years and years. 30 years ago, we were going to his church to share. I would have been 12. Um, <laughs> but um, I recently heard that he had had a heart attack. And, uh, and so I, I called him last night and spoke with him for almost two hours. And uh, we prayed together and chatted. And uh, amazing, amazing story of just the Lord. You know, holding him in the palm of his hand. He, uh, he's the guy that runs CSN, which is, you know, a network that has a lot of the radio stations we're on, hundreds of them. And, um, and he wasn't feeling well the other day. He went in and, uh, and actually started feeling better on the way to the hospital, listening to his husband, and said, I feel better, let's just go home. And wife, he said, no, you weren't feeling too well just a few minutes ago, let's go into the hospital. They went, and he was probably there about 10 minutes, 
and fully coded and went flatline. He died for two minutes. And they were able to bring him back. And he woke up and said, I, I'm sorry, I, I think I passed out. And he said, no, you died. <laughs> Which is an unusual thing to hear when you wake up. But the, man, God did so many awesome things. They had the stint in his heart within about 20 minutes of him being in the hospital which used to take a, a, a surgery now they're able to you know put it in through different just amazing god obviously has more for him to do but keep him in your prayers and and also you know just remember you know the sleep and, and food thing and <clears throat> we're going back to the name thing and and here's the thing gang um if I come up to you and start chatting with you, it's not the first thing out of our mouths, usually. Although in other, you go to other countries, it can be, kill, come see I'm a, say I'm a divi, you know, or, uh, what's your name? And then you tell them your name. But usually the, that comes later. Sometimes if the relationship isn't deep enough, you don't, don't tell them at all. Or don't tell them your last name if you're not sure who this person is. You know? But if I start and I say, hey, my name's David. And I'm a husband and a father. And last name's McGee. So I got a tribal name there, if you will. And I, uh, I'm a pastor and uh, a musician and write songs and poetry and uh, each one of those labels each one of those names gives you an insight into who I am now if we were getting close and I said a dozen names I don't know how many I just said maybe that was not I would say a dozen names and you go man those are such cool names but you know what? I think I'll call you Fred. Well, well, Fred's not actually one one of my names. So you could, you know, call me something else, and and that would be my name. I like Fred. Well, okay, okay. Now sometimes you might have an instance where, you know, you're. Uh, Maybe even mistaken about the name, you know, or something like that. And, but then what do you do if somebody comes up and says, hey, you know, his name's not Fred. Oh, what is it? It's Samuel. Oh, okay. Hey, Fred. Man, I just told you his name's Samuel. I'm liking Fred. <laughs> that would be sort of weird and rude, wouldn't it? <clears throat> Some of you might be knowing where I'm going, but it, we're not going to hop there just, just yet. Um, I do believe God has given us an untapped, amazing resource in his names and actually early on in life and ministry I read a book K okay, authors I want to know you Lord I don't know if you've ever read the book it's an amazing book now it, it you know there's some needed uh, updates and we actually had you know K okay, author here but in it she goes all into the names of the Lord and there's beautiful names. And this book, it's probably 30 years old, maybe, maybe longer, maybe older. But it's just a, a beautiful book, and it makes you realize, even in this verse right here, it says, the mighty one, God, the Lord. Mm. So not digging into, not... Yeah, looking at the Hebrew text right now, God the Lord is probably Elohim, 
Ha Yahweh. So that L O R D is that tetragrammaton, that Y H V H that we pronounce Yahweh. Another thing <clears throat> that um, We start talking about the name. Of course, we think about the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, it says, don't use the name in vain. Now, it may surprise some people to learn that if you say, oh my God, and you're not praying, you're using God's name in vain. Because you're just saying, oh my God, you're not calling him. And when you call his name, he wants you to be talking to him. So he says, don't use my name in vain. But like other parts of the Ten Commandments, such as no adultery, what it's also saying is that marriage is the correct and healthy and wholesome and good place for intimate relations. But outside that bond is not God. It's a sin. Tied to, interestingly enough, idolatry. Which brings up a point, I don't, I don't think we're going to have time to, to get there tonight. But law for, for centuries, for thousands of years, people have grouped the Ten Commandments, not in the first four and last six. We talked about that before. The Jews taught that the four, first four were weightier, heavier, more serious. And Jesus calls them on that and says, you know, the weightier things are loving people. And so the first is tied to the sixth, second to the seventh, the third to the eighth the fourth to the ninth and, and so forth and so on. And so idolatry, no graven images, is tied to no adultery. It's interesting. So when it says don't use his name in vain, the real uh, fulfillment positively is using his name correctly. Right? Don't use it in vain. Use it correctly. Use it off and talk to him. And I know that the Jewish people have the... When I say Hebraic, I'm usually referring to a biblical Messianic Jew. When I say Jew, unless I say Messianic, I'm talking about somebody that believes in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, believes in the God of the Old Testament, but does not yet believe <clears throat> that Jesus is the Messiah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, honoring God's name is a good thing. But after digging and studying both history and the Bible and manuscripts and whatnot, well, in a simple way, let me put it like this. We as Christians don't honor overall the name enough. And I do believe what some of the Jewish groups do is not honoring God's name. 
I love to do word studies and see patterns. And when I say that, here's what I mean. You simply take a word like uh, pierced or idols or something like that, and you see where it occurs in the Bible, and you read the verses that relate to it, and you can, it's a fascinating way, great way to learn about the Bible. Now, there's a verse, Leviticus 24, and if you would, uh, maybe if you could can bring this up. This is the verse that is used to say we can mess up the name and so we want to be very careful with it. Now what you need to understand before we look at this verse is one of the primary names of God used for God in the Hebrew scriptures and still today is simply the name. The name. In the Hebrew, Ha Shem. Shem is name. Ha is the. Ha Shem. The name. So they address God as the name. Okay? Which I think is awesome and respectful, and that's what the Word of God uh, itself does. Now, when we look at Leviticus 24, and that's at the bottom of page 3 on the media the verse reads and the Israelites woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord is in parentheses and cursed and so they brought him to Moses and then in parentheses is his mother's name was Shilomith the daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan close parentheses Now, we need to understand, just like the Lord thing, and that's in the front of your Bible, by the way. They do tell you that in the front of your Bible, and some of that stuff is honestly kind of important. So you might want to look through the front of your Bible and the back of your Bible and look what tools you have. Also, let me tell you, be very careful about these notes on the bottom of the page. Very careful. The verses are anointed and you know uh, perfect in the in, in the original scrolls and the the little footnotes there those are not perfect let me promise you let me guarantee you and we're going to learn a little bit about them here tonight now understand when we read a verse and in that verse Words are either in italics or, um, and that, that primary, I think they're, it's in italics. Uh, and sometimes, like we just saw, they're in parentheses. Well, what, what does that mean? Is that just like when you're reading a book and say, no, 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 no. It's very important, that little tool. Just like the capitalization of Lord helps you know what's behind the scenes. Those parentheses help you to know, too, because what they're saying is the letters, the words in those parentheses are not in the original text. They've added them to make it more readable. Here's that in a life lesson. When we are reading the Bible and we see something in italics or in parentheses, it means it is not in the original text but was added for readability to be able to read it easier. This is an iffy at best practice. And we'll examine that and see why. It's important to look what's in parentheses or in italics and read it without it because that's directly what it says. Now, in some cases, it does make it better and clear what they add. In some cases, it doesn't. And even though it might just be a minutia off, that can start something. 
And if you think just being a little bit off in one place is not a big deal, it starts to add up. As a matter of fact, next life lesson. If your compass is one degree off and you leave Los Angeles going to Honolulu, you will not end up in Honolulu. You will miss the islands entirely. If your compass is one degree off and you leave Los Angeles going to Honolulu, you will not end up in Honolulu. You will miss the islands entirely. So yeah, being a little bit off starts to add up. And so that leads us, and I know I'm hitting you with a lot of life lessons, but these are really important and uh, prayerfully put together. And here's another one. When reading the Bible, look to the original text and the original intended meaning. Look for the main and plain messages of the Bible. Let me say that again. When reading the Bible, look to the original text and original intended meaning. Look for the main and plain messages of the Bible. Now, here's an important little tidbit of history that is really important. You will often see the Masorettes or Masorites um, referred to. And we'll, we're going to be learning a little bit more about this group. Um, when we hear it and we hear uh, Masoretic manuscripts and texts, we think, oh yeah, well they must have been like at the time of Moses or David or, or maybe the, the minor prophets in, in 500 BC, right? No. The Masoretes really came to be known around 200 AD in a group that rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They gained strength in numbers from about 500 AD to about 1000 AD. And at one point, the oldest Bible we had was theirs. From 1000 AD, 1000 years after, after Jesus. And they, their scroll had all the vowels added. Those are some even called Masoretic points. They operate mainly in Jerusalem, in Tiberias, and Babylon. And you need to understand these people do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah. So Pastor, are you saying they messed with the Bible and mistranslated it? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Um, it may fascinate you to know that before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Masoretes said, Psalm 22, 16 said, like a lion, my hands and feet. And I've got Hebrew Bibles, that that's how they translate it in English. Well, in our English Bibles, it says he was pierced with his hands and his feet. And so there was discussion about which one was right. And honestly, most academics went with the Masoretes. The Masoret saying the lion, like a lion, hands and feet. Well... At the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is the most important biblical and archaeological find ever, it was discovered in 1947 in Qumran, Israel. In 1948, the next year, Israel became a nation for the first time in almost 2,000 years. What a coincidence that is, isn't that amazing? And so they had the Dead Sea Scrolls. They actually sold them in, in the Wall Street Journal, listed them for $250,000 a piece. And uh, Arab folks come over to sell them, and what they, they thought they were selling them to Americans. They were, the Israelis came over and secretly bought them and took them back. It's a fascinating, fascinating story. But until that time, they were still going back and forth about Psalm 2216. 
But then we get to the Dead Sea Scrolls and we get to the Essenes and we look at what they have, the scroll of Isaiah and all that stuff, and it is very clearly pierced his hands and feet. Written over 500 years before they started crucifying people. And here's another fascinating little thing. In all the thousands of years of history, there was only a 50-year span that a Jewish man would have been crucified on a cross rather than been stoned. The Jewish way was to condemn them and stone them. Everybody throw rocks at them. But Rome frustrated with Israel in 20 AD said you know what you guys no longer get to say who lives and who dies you no longer have control of yourselves you no longer have control over capital punishment you have to come to us now that's bad enough you're losing your your leadership per se but it was much worse than that because in Psalm 49 it said that the scepter will not pass from Israel until Shiloh comes That's a messianic prophecy saying Israel will not lose its leadership until the Messiah comes. So in 20 AD, when Rome pulls this, their rabbis running through the street grieving, tearing their clothes, saying the promise has been broken and Messiah is not here. Little did they know, there was a young man in Galilee, the Messiah, Hamashiach, the Messiah. Mashiach is the Hebrew word for Messiah. Mashiach. That's fun to say. Say Mashiach. Yeah, do, do that, Mashiach. You might want to come in. It's fun to say, Mashiach. And it, it, like one, one of the, the guy who came over on, on uh, Mayflower said he studied Hebrew because he wanted to hear what the words God said when he spoke. That's a pretty cool way to look at it. So, in this Leviticus 24, it actually says, if you remove the... the parentheses point it says and the Israelite son blasphemed the name and cursed so he was punished it doesn't say he blasphemed the name of the Lord it says he blasphemed the name of the Lord has been added and it really does kind of just teensy kind of shade it and thank God it's in parentheses so we can see it That speaks of the integrity of the translation process. So here's the life lesson. Leviticus 24.11 is the verse that is used to not to try to say the name of the Lord. But we just talked about the commandment. That says don't use his name in vain and it infers God wants us to use his name appropriately. So Recall, you know, calling him Hashem or the name is a good thing. But here, here's another issue that you need to be aware of. You know, I pray these Hebrew prayers over you guys, right? In the old building, actually, we painted the Shema on the wall. And we had a dear Messianic Jewish lady come by and she said, I, Pastor Dave, I really appreciate you putting the Shema on the wall over here, but... Uh, I got to tell you, you you put the wrong name for God. And it's supposed to be Adonai. And I said, no, it's it's spoken as Adonai, but it's written as Yahweh. And she said, oh, no, 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 it's written as it's written as Adonai. That's the way we say it. I said, I know it's the way you say it, but it's actually Yahweh. Go go look and let me know what you see. And she she did, did it in a sweet sweet way, but she came back and she said. Pastor, I apologize. You're right. It says Yahweh. 
And what they do is every time it says Yahweh, they substitute Adonai, which means Lord as well, but it's a different word for Lord. So here's, and you're seeing it correctly, we respectfully and revere this name so much, we're going to change it and never say it. Go through and do a word study of the name and look at all that we're told to do. We're told to praise the name. We're told to call on the name. We're told to say the name. As a matter of fact, if we can't say the name, if we're never supposed to use God's name, and that's what some would lead us to believe, boy, something just got out of reach. Something real important. Why is that? Romans 10, 13. So whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you don't call on his name, you can't be saved. So, I believe they overshot it. And that, that brings up a, another subject. Let me encourage you to use the different names of God that would be appropriate to, to ministry to you personally. Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Then he has told you his name is Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. If you need peace, you come to him. Read your word before you go to bed. Talk to God a little bit. And the Prince of Peace put you out like a light. Or maybe you need to know he's providing for you. And of course we have, no, that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, which Je Jehovah is a, uh, well, interesting enough, the Masoretes are a little bit involved in that too. They gave us the vowel points that kind of led us to think there were uh, four syllables and four vowels in Yehovah. And the Dead Sea Scrolls revealed that it was Yahweh, as others had taught and thought, with two syllables. And uh, there's also, you know, that becomes important, especially when you consider that the sign above the head of Jesus, the acronym was, the, the first word started with a yo, with a hey, with a vav, with a hey. And they were big on, you know, acronyms. And also understand something. When I said the first verse of a psalm to you, it was insinuated I was saying read the rest of it. Here's the first fruit. Dig in. Why is that important? Because Jesus quoted Psalm 22, 1 from the cross. And go back and read that psalm. And it describes his experience on the cross 500 years before it happened. Mm. Mm -mm. Leviticus 24.16 is another verse that it goes into the thing about being put to death and, and whatnot. And so I understand, you know, we, we absolutely need to respect the name of God. And if you say, oh my God, or you think it's okay because you don't pronounce the G and you say, oh my God, or oh my gosh, it's still, I don't know. You know, oh my gosh came from oh my God. So can you imagine being in a room full of people and have them all saying your name, but none of them talking to you? And then out of that, 
And all of a sudden, you hear somebody say your name in the original language it was given. It's just a way to respect God and honor God and to, to learn things. So we, we talked about when you see that word Lord here in the first verse, that, there's a Bible lesson here, and that's at the end of uh, page four on the notes, on the printed version anyway. It's whenever you see Lord in the Bible spelled capital L-O-R-D, that means it's the yod Hey vav Hey or what we now know to be Yahweh. So whenever you see Lord in the Bible, spelled Lord, capital Lord, that means it's the yod Hey vav Hey or what we now know to be Yahweh. Mm. Praise God. Hmm. Next Bible lesson kind of goes with this, and these will be available in mine too. Is when we see Lord spelled Lord, capital L O R D, and O R D and not capital, it's Adonai. So you got Adonai, Yahweh, Elohim is, a, is another one. And it's interesting when we say Adonai, I know we translate it as Lord, roughly, and, and roughly it is. But it brings us our next life lesson. And let me describe it before we go into the life lesson. Adon is Lord singular, non-possessive. Adonai is two things. It's plural. Like El and Elohim. Adon, Adonai. It's what you call plural possessive. That's a fancy English word that I'm sure I knew nothing about when I was going to college. <laughs> but, but plural possessive means this. When you say Adonai, you are saying, my Lord. My Lord. You are my Lord. You are my King. These names are are important. Skipping down to Psalm 8, chapter 8, verse 9. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And Psalm 18, 49 says, Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises unto thy name. Psalm 20, verse 1. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The Lord, hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob, defend thee. Psalm 20, verse 5. We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all the petitions. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Now notice those aren't in parentheses or italics. This is what it reads. And Psalm 22, 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. O magnify, Psalm 34, 3. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So uh, there's a longer list. We'll put it online. And you can look in a blue letter Bible or something like that and, you know, put in um, the name or the name of God and you'll just be amazed. And so I do think as Christians we need to honor more the names of God. They're descriptive terms he gave to us to minister to us. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I want to paint you a picture. And imagine 
coming into Jerusalem. And you're Gentile, but you want to worship. So you go to Jerusalem because the temples are. And you get there and you start to go through the, the first gate. And somebody, whoa, whoa, hang on now. Where are you going? I'm going here. I want to find out about God. Well, are you Jewish? Well, no, I'm Gentile. Why is that important? Well, only if you go past the second gate. Well, why is it important if I go past the second gate? They'll kill you for being a Gentile. Can't be in that part of the temple. No, okay. Well, I want to go to that tabernacle part, that temple part. Oh, no, no, can't do it. It's only for Jewish people. Really? Yep. Well, I wish I was Jewish so I could go to the the temple. Well, no, not just any Jews can go. Well, what do you mean? Well, you got to be of the tribe of Aaron. Well, I wish I was Jewish and wish I was tribe of Aaron so I could go. Well, no, no, no. I mean tribe of Levi, excuse me. Tribe of Levi. said, said, well, I wish I was Jew and tribe of Levi so I could go into the temple and worship. He goes, oh, not so fast now. You had to be the family, uh, the, the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. Well, I wish I was a Jew and the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron so I could go worship in the building. Well, not so fast. Only the high priest could go in there. Well, I wish I was a high priest so I could go in there. Not so fast. He only went in there one day a year. It's a day of atonement. Well, I wish I was that high priest on that one day a year so I could go in there and worship. Well, I understand it might kill you. <laughs> The high priest on the day of atonement went in to atone for the sins of himself and Israel. And there were belts on the robe. And they would, they, nobody else could be in the temple on the day of atonement. Only the high priest in the whole thing. Can you imagine the silence? They would wait outside and try to hear the bells on the hem of the garment. Because if the ringing ceased, they would conclude that the high priest had been killed, fallen dead. Something went wrong. And there's a tradition, it's not in the Bible, but it is in some other writings that... Uh, you know, if that happened, how do, you, how do you get him out? I mean, it's like, who, well, who wants to go in there and get him? Well, not me. <laughs> so, the tradition says that they would tie a rope to his ankle in case when he went in there, he was struck dead. There was a great joy and responsibility in that position. He got to speak the name of the Lord to people. And understand, in the Gospels, it's presented, hey, his name is Jesus because he will save people from their sins. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. God gives us those names again to minister to us. And, and so while we're, we, we can learn more respect for the name, we also at the same time need to be more actively praising his name, learning you know, some of his names. And what's cool, what's really awesome if you think about it, and we're going to the final life lesson, is these names don't change. He's been 
Yahweh for thousands of years. He's been Sar Shalom for thousands of years. He's been Yeshua. Jesus, God is our salvation for thousands of years. His name doesn't change. And we can call on his name. And it's interesting because, see, his name's unchanging. And part of us wants something unchanging. But every day is a little different, isn't it? And so we also go through changes. And God leads us through those changes with the stability of knowing his name that never changes. Here's life lesson. Don't count on rejoicing in your circumstances because circumstances change. The Lord and the Bible say rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And the Lord changes not. Let me say that again. Don't count on rejoicing in your circumstances because your circumstances change. The Lord and the Bible say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Lord changes not. Hmm. Let's start talking about his name. Let's start talking about his promises instead of talking about our problems. When we talk about how God honors his word, even though man seems to keep breaking it. Mm. And may we know that the Lord changes, changes not. Now some of these, I tell you what, some of the names given in Scripture are just so, so beautiful. And, and we've mentioned some of them before. Goel, kinsman redeemer. And of course again, Ha is the, so Ha Goel is the kinsman redeemer. We're going to close and have communion. And uh, I think actually I'm going to share this song. Uh, I'm going to ask the ushers to come up. And if you've been born again and you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, you're welcome to have communion with us. If you don't believe in Jesus as your Messiah and you haven't asked him to forgive you, then this would be an empty religious ritual. And there's no need for an empty religious ritual. And the word itself encourages us not to take it if we don't know God as our Savior. So if you know God as your Savior, um, they're bringing the elements now. Then in a moment, begin to come and get the elements and just hold what you have. And in a few minutes, we'll, we'll partake together. Um, I want to share some more of these names with you. Now, this is really, really raw, okay? And I'm still working on these names myself. So, but some of them might really, really minister to you. And, uh, and I was thinking about Kay Arthur's book the other day, and it's got a different chapter with each name, and, and the Lord ended up giving me a song with different names in them that also give the English version. So, I'm going to share it. May you grant me mercy and grace as I uh, kind of get my way through it. But I want to pray over these elements and let's focus on the Lord. And, and think of the names that you already know for the Lord. That Prince of Peace. Maybe that's for you. Emmanuel, God with us. 
Maybe that's you. Mm. Lord, thank you for giving us your names. Lord, you don't give your name to strangers. You give your name to friends. And really good friends, you, you give several names, many names. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us many names so that we can understand you more. God, help us to use our, our brains and our lives to understanding you and following you. And Lord, thank you for the Last Supper that was indeed a Passover dinner. You said, I've longed to celebrate the Passover with you. Lord, thank you for those elements of your unleavened bread and the juice as your poured out blood. Mm. So simple, but so deep. Lord, thank you for that picture in Genesis 40 when Joseph is in the prison. And the baker baking unleavened bread and the butler, but wine steward, wine taster. And you gave Joseph those dream interpretations involving bread and wine. And said to the one set free, remember me when you get out of here. When you get out of prison, remember me. And Lord, communion is about remembering you. And Lord, so often when we are set free, set free out of our prison, we don't remember you as often as we should. So Lord, help us turn to you more often. Lord, thank you for the pictures, for the symbols, for the letters, for the words, for the names. So we can know you. Lord, we thank you for your broken body and your poured out blood. By which we can be redeemed, forgiven, and experience eternal life. Lord, we thank you for these symbols and these gifts. In Hashem Yahshua, the name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. So if you just would make your way towards the communion table, and then as I uh, as you do that, I'll uh, go through this song and share it with you.
So let's call him by his names. Let's call him by his names. Call him by his names. He is Lachem Elohim. He is the bread of God. He's Lachem Elohim. He is the bread of God. He's Lechem Shamaim. He is the bread of heaven. He's Lechem Shamaim. He is the bread of heaven. He's Lechem Elohim. He's Lechem Shamaim. He is the bread of God. He is the bread of heaven. He is Hasha Mek Yeshua. He's Jesus the Messiah. Ha Mashiach Yeshua. He is Hasha Miyak. Hallelujah. He is Hash Mashiach Yeshua. He is Jesus the Messiah. He is Ha Mashiach Yeshua. He's HaMashiach, hallelujah, the Messiah, hallelujah. So let's call him by his names. Call him by his names. He is HaGoel, he's the kinsman redeemer. He's Emmanuel, he is God with us. He is HaGoel. He's the kinsman redeemer. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's Hagoel, kinsman redeemer. He's Emmanuel. God with us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for those names that tell us so much about you and why you came and even what we mean to you. You're the kinsman redeemer. 100% man and 100% God. Emmanuel, God with us. Ha direct the way. Ha am at the truth. Hashayim, you are the life. Lechem Elohim, he is the bread of God. Lechem Hashamayim, he is the bread of heaven. Hamashiach Yeshua, he is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world who died for you. Maybe, maybe pick out one of these names and begin to use it in, in your prayer life. Maybe the bread of God or the bread of heaven. Maybe you're suffering with loneliness and he's Emmanuel. Maybe you're ashamed of your mistakes. Remember, he's your kinsman redeemer. He's related to you. He knows you. Mm. And while we look at these names which so describe him, he knows your name. He's loved you with an everlasting love. Ahavat Olam, everlasting love. Ahava is Hebrew for love. To say everlasting love, you take love and put a cross on it. Ahavat Olam, I have loved you 
with an everlasting love. And I have called you by your name. He even tells us in one place that he has a new name for us. As he gives us this white stone through his shed blood and his broken body. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the pain and the suffering that you went through. Thank you that all the odds were against you fulfilling this and all these incredible prophecies, and yet they were fulfilled. And Lord, thank you for the pattern of seeing the spring feast as things are coming to life. That was you as the lamb. He came. And then we look to the fall feast, which have yet to be fulfilled. And the leaves are changing color. And they're dropping off. And time is winding down. Lord, help us to be ready. And to get others ready as well. And Lord, thank you for the privilege and the honor of not only knowing your name, but being able to speak it and being able to sing it. It's an honor we could never, ever deserve or earn, and yet an honor that you've given to us. And so tonight we call on you, Yeshua, Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, our Hagoel, the kinsman redeemer. And we thank you for your act of redemption on the cross. And we thank you for these symbols of your body and your blood. Lord, help us to each understand what you mean when you say your everlasting love. You loved us before we were in the womb. And Lord, thank you that even though we see life as something temporary and death as something permanent, we got it backwards. Life with you is permanent. It's eternal. And death with you is a transition. It's temporary. Lord, thank you for everlasting love. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for being our Prince of Peace. And Lord, I ask that your peace would be upon each of us as we remember not what you did for the neighbor down the street or what you did for the pastor or this person. No, no. What you did for us, what you did for each person listening. The night in which you were betrayed, you took the bread and you broke it and you said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take it and eat it and remember me. Let's all partake and remember Jesus. Think about life. Think about Jesus. Lord, we thank you for these powerful symbols, powerful elements. Lord, we ask that you would work healings, physical healings, in people here receiving communion and people at home receiving communion. Lord, we can be healed. 
after the supper, you took the cup and you said, this is the cup of the new covenant. And Lord, you entered into a Nazarite vow saying, I won't drink this again until heaven. Or the other two parts of that vow are not cutting your hair, not shaving, and not touching anything dead. So Lord, as you've been welcoming people into heaven, Lord, you're not touching anything dead. Those people are more alive than they've ever been. And Lord, we thank you that should we not go in the rapture that each one of us, Lord, will get to stand in front of you and have our tears wiped away by your nail-scarred hand. We love you, Lord. Think about life. Think about Jesus. Think about redemption and freedom telling others. Let's think about Jesus. Let's partake. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being our Messiah, our Mashiach. Thank you for being our Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Thank you for being our Savior. And most of all, God, we thank you for being our friend and loving us and teaching us. Thank you for an awesome evening in you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine on you. May he lift up his countenance to you. And may you be filled with his shalom, his peace. And Hashem Yahshua, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. In Hebrew, right? Amen. God loves you and we love you. And uh, think about the names of the Lord. And let that minister to you. Mm. God really does love you.